We're going to roll straight on now to uh, the opening panel. So I'm going to invite uh, the uh, participants. Uh, Godfrey Liebrandt is the Chief Executive, of, uh, Executive Officer of SWIFT. John Owen, who's the Chief Executive Officer for International Banking at RBS. Paul Sharma, who's Director of Policy for the Prudential Regulatory Authority. And John Trundle, who's the Chief Executive at Euroclear UK and Ireland. If I can invite the four of them to uh, take their seats here. Uh, while they're on their way up, let me tell you just a little bit about them. Uh, Gottfried uh, has been Chief Executive since uh, 2012. He joined SWIFT in 2005 and he'd worked at McKinsey's before that. Uh, John Owen's responsible for uh, the whole range of uh, the international banking network at RBS, uh, including lending and transaction service products and the provision of market products. Uh, before RBS, he spent 13 years at Credit Suisse. He's also been at UBS and the Bank of America. America. Uh, John Trundle joined Euroclear from the Bank of England in 2005. He's a, a monetary policy economist by training. And Paul Sharma, Deputy Head of the Prudential Regula Regulation Authority, leading 150 staff, also sitting on European and international regulatory bodies. And he was, once upon a time, Director of Prudential Policy at the FSA. Whether he regards that as a career plus or a career minus uh, will come through during the course of the conversation, I imagine. Uh, gentlemen, you're all very welcome. Uh, thank you all for adhering to the uh, Project IKEA seating plan uh, that's been on the board behind you as well. That's very helpful for me and for everyone else as well. We're going to have a bit of a chat then. I'm going to bring in your questions as soon as we uh, can. Uh, let's start with the the regulatory wave that is sweeping over the financial industry and what impact that is going to have. John. Well, it has a number of different impacts, clearly, on the way you have to try and run a banking business. Um, it affects you in the way, in the cost structure which is imposed upon you from the capital you have to allocate, the liquidity buffers are imposed, but it also actually gets into the roots of the business and what you find is that very, very significant portions of time of people operating in the banking industry is now spent dealing with things which probably, all said and done, should have been dealt with much more in the past. The proportion of time that bankers spend at senior levels in organisations uh, such as RBS on responding directly and indirectly to the regulatory uh, uh, moves of late has probably risen to in excess of 50% of the time. I mean, it's very, very material. And frankly, the banks, it's, it's self-inflicted. It's because the amount of time spent in these matters in the past has been too little. I think it's the job of the banks, however, to try and find a way of dealing with that the pendulum has clearly swung. Some may argue it's swung too far. That, frankly, is academic. It's done what it's done. But it's to deal with that, but at the same time, it's actually try and provide the services its customers need, be they retail uh, or, or, or corporate or, or institutional. So, so finding that balance is very tough. It takes a huge amount of energy, and it will undoubtedly make the price of banking, if you like, the license to operate the banks have to pay, has gone up and has gone up dramatically. And trying to square that away, as we were hearing from John earlier, with the needs of the bank industry to try and finance and oil the wheels of industry, if you like, around the world, that conflict is a difficult one to manage, and that's really the core attention uh, thing on which we need to pay our attention right now. John, thank you very much. John Trundle, your thoughts? We're undoubtedly in a very strong up phase of regulation, and uh, it's still got a way to go. Uh, I agree with uh, John's implied remark, I think it will go too far and in many ways it will carry the seeds of its own destruction and we will get to uh, an end point where there will be too much regulation and we'll have a burning of uh, regulation again in order to stimulate the economy and so on. But we have to take it as it is uh, today uh, and what we see is a much increasing cost structure for the industry and so individual institutions having to address that and find ways of reducing cost. I think what we see uh, in our organisation increasingly is firms looking at what they do and saying, what am I best at? What, do I, uh, what am I really effective at? Where do I add value and make money? And as a result, the boring stuff that uh, lots of people do, they're saying, How, isn't there a better way to do that? And Aaron, in his opening remarks, referred to the advantages of collaboration uh, in terms of trying to do common things uh, together in order to get cost out of the system. And I think that is uh, one of the positive responses to the weight of regulation that we're seeing today. Paul Sharma, both of them mentioning the cost 
of the regulatory burden. Mm -hmm. Does that cut any ice with the PRA? Well, let me say, I, I think there are two different types of cost, and it's important to distinguish between them. There's what I would call the compliance cost, the cost of you know, the, uh, the, the salaries and the IS uh, in, order to, um, in order to comply. And then there is a, 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 a more significant um, a, 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 but more fundamental cost, which is a, 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 to do with the actual requirements themselves, you know, the level of capital and the level of liquidity. Now, on those, I, I quite simply say, I mean, financial intermediaries have clearly got a role uh, um, to, to, to take in one set of financial promises and give out a different set of financial promises and mismatch. That's, that's their economic function. And banks mismatch in one way, insurance companies mismatch in, in, in another way. But quite frankly, there was too much mismatching going on within financial institutions. It had got to a point where it was quite frankly unsafe. Um, the, 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 the substance of the rules is to, is to reduce that mismatching. It has profound business model implications. Um, it, 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 uh, 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 reducing that mismatching, uh, I don't think increases cost, but it does internalize cost. It takes some of the cost of doing business that actually was never recognized and was borne by the state and imposes it upon the, uh, uh, the financial institutions themselves, the ones who are getting the rewards. To, you know. Now that gives the appearance of increasing costs, but the costs were always there. Separately on the compliance issues, um, and, you know, there there is genuine cost, um, but, but quite frankly, uh, 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 you know, one of the things we learned from the, the um, uh, the crisis is, is banks and insurance companies and other financial intermediaries did not have good enough systems on the whole to know what was going on. Uh, and that, that, that needs a degree of, uh, of cost on people and, on, and on, uh, on IS infrastructure in order not to be in that position again. The not so subtle message is that they are getting the regulation that they deserve. They're getting the regulation that's appropriate for the risks that they're taking, and more importantly, more of, but not yet all of, the costs of their business are appearing on their own income statements rather than contingently on that of the state. And the danger of the regulatory pendulum swinging too far the other way, because this is how cycles work in business. C certainly, uh, um, there is a regulatory pendulum, pendulum and um, it does swing from lighter regulation to heavier regulation. I'm not sure, looking back, one would, clue, one would conclude that um, some of the previous peaks of heavy regulation were necessarily too far. Yeah, just, just because regulation swings in one direction and, the, and then in the other. You know, is, is it really true that, that, that uh, uh, the regulation we had 15, 20 years ago was, was, was too far for the times? I'm, I'm not so sure. It may well be inappropriate today because of technological change and because the world has changed. Uh, as for the regulations we currently have, again, I'm unconvinced that, uh, uh, that they have uh, in any sense swung too far. Uh, quite contrary, I, I think we have not yet uh, fully or sufficiently dealt with the too big to fail, fail problem. Uh, we have not yet fully or sufficiently dealt with the, uh, the problem that I was referring to earlier, on which we've made progress, which is internalizing the costs of doing business to the institutions uh, rather than having them contingently lie upon the state. Not fully dealt with yet. Yes. Do I read into that you're waiting for ring fencing to happen? or you think ring, ring fencing isn't enough? So ring fencing uh, is a very substantial part of what needs to be done. The important thing about ring fencing is how it is done, that it is done well. Uh, the, uh, uh, the further reforms that are, the further reforms beyond Basel III that are being negotiated in Basel are an important part of that. Uh, the reforms for systemically important institutions, banks and insurance companies and other uh, uh, non-bank, non-insurance companies are another important part. The, the, in other words, the domestic and European and, and, uh, uh, and global regulatory agenda uh, is, is what is needed to be pursued. I, I thought I detected a little hint that you privately thought it didn't go far enough, that the banks should be broken up. 
so there may uh, uh, yeah, there, there does need there needs to be a debate upon the structure of banking uh, within the UK that bank debate is not purely a prudential debate yeah, it's also a competition debate, and therefore one that uh, that that, uh, that goes uh, significantly wider than the PRAs uh, 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 we met. But there certainly does need to be a debate about the structure of banking in the UK. Okay, I'm not sure what question that was answering, but we read into the answer what you said, uh, Godfrey. It's striking that both the the bankers, the transactors on the uh, panel have picked up some of the themes that Swift has been talking about already, the need for collaboration. Uh, so in terms of actually just recognizing that there are costs and this is how you deal with it rather than simply moaning about it. And that's right. And I was thinking there's maybe to highlight, uh, I always think of it as three peaks rather than twin peaks of regulation. The twin peaks being uh, the first peak is making sure the system doesn't blow up. That's the prudential oversight. The second peak being don't take advantage of, of your customers. That's all the, the conduct, uh, authority, competition, etc. And I think there's almost a third peak emerging, which is don't help the bad guys, if you will, which is everything around tax, know your customer, anti-money laundering and sanctions, which I think in, in some cases is swept under conduct, but I, I really think it's driven separately. The, the first two have really gotten an upshot from the crisis, I think, both the, the, the systemic oversight and, uh, and the customer uh, conduct. The third one is almost independent of that, I think largely driven by the Americans, uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm honest, they've given a big push to that. Um, and a lot of the costs that we see, at least in banks, are driven by that third peak, the need to uh, AML, KYC, uh, all of the, all of that uh, behavior, where almost you know, some banks are arguing that banks increasingly are being used as a police force, almost as law enforcement uh, agency. Uh, in, in, in. You can you can debate whether whether that's the case, but that's where we see a lot of the compliance costs uh, happening, and that is an area where common solutions can really help. Partly also because that is an area where some of the uh, requ uh, requirements tend to be extraterritorial and conflicting, uh, if you will. We've seen that in the case of taxes, uh, where where UBS was caught between being in breach of U.S. law, and if they were to comply, they would be in breach of Swiss law in terms of, uh, of, of bank, uh, bank frequency. So you really see conflicts uh, there. And there, cooperation is needed, and joint utilities, uh, joint utilities uh, can, uh, can help. Um, and I think that's where we can play a role, where uh, many of the market infrastructures can play a role in terms of creating, creating that common behavior and taking some of the cost out of the system. John, so, obviously, there is a limit to how much collaboration can take place between financial companies? Yes, but I have to say, I think the industry's been incredibly pig-headed in the way it's approached, in particular the AML, KYC type things. I mean, we're essentially transacting with the same entities around the world, and yet we all are building at very, very great costs. And I think if you added up the amount of money being spent on trying to build databases, trying to ensure that every counterparty that you interact with is appropriately documented. The total cost of that is well, you know, is in the billions. I mean, this is a huge amount of money going to provide something which provides no particular competitive advantage to any one party when you've got it, other than you know maybe a small timing one. The truth is, it would make an enormous amount of sense for the industry, and there are discussions ongoing to try and find some central utility functions around, in particular, that that area. And, and you know, it, it just is a very rational thing to do. What changes that pig-headedness? Uh, economic necessity. And the economic necessity is very real. And, and, and you know, I think it, there's no, it's not bad that pressures, and, and we talk about regulation in, in a very negative way in a lot of the conversations we've had. There are a lot of good things that come out of having smart regulation. And one of them is to force people to deal with fundamental inefficiencies in the system in trying to actually get a decent economic return for the shareholders in the business while conducting yourself in a proper, proper way, ensuring you understand who it is you're dealing with and what it is that you're actually processing in terms of money flows. So, so the, I think we are at the cusp with these kinds of things need to get done. It's not easy. You know, the organizations technologically are very flawed in the banking world, uh, as, as many of us in this room know. Many of the systems which, which under, underpin fundamental payments and, 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 and client data systems are, in many cases, literally decades old in these banks, and they've been layered and layered to try and improve and patchworked over the years, trying to then unpick that and find a way in which you can 
put it together with other databases is a big challenge. But it's not without a will at this point. Mm. And Paul Sharma, just taking the, the temperature of the regulator, you're, you're fairly relaxed about collaboration where it is appropriate. So there are obviously competition issues that arise with, with collaboration, and we in the PRA are not the competition regulator, and any collaboration needs to, uh, needs to respect those issues. Subject to that, um, we are very welcoming of such collaboration. Uh, uh, Safety and soundness, financial stability is a quite difficult, dare I say, impossible thing to, for individual banks to obtain without uh, 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 there are other banks, other insurance companies, other non-bank financials doing similar things. Uh, whether that's in the money laundering space, whether that's in the uh, right culture space, uh, 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 whether that's in the resilience of the infrastructure space, etc., uh, there is plenty of room for uh, 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 for such cooperation. Thank you, John. Trotter, do you take Paul's earlier point that uh, this isn't higher cost from regulation? It's simply a more transparent expression of costs that were already in the system. Well, I'm a former regulator myself, so I have a lot of sympathy for the, the problems that regulators uh, face. Uh, and it is about trying to get the right balance. And the point I was trying to make at the beginning is just about, if you like, the speed of the pendulum moving. It was very similar to the point uh, John Gieve was making uh, in his speech, which is we were in a position which was wrong, which I agree with, with, with Paul, where everybody missed it uh, in the uh, five plus uh, years ago. Uh, and we have conflicting needs now. So on the one hand, we want to get back to a steady state in terms of regulation about where it should be, but the needs of the economy are pushing in, in a different uh, direction. And so we need smart regulation. So I, I, I don't believe that less regulation or more regulation uh, are a good thing. It is about getting the right regulation and that we have to do line by line according to the, the relevant industry that we're talking about. And so I know so that's smart the regulation? Smart regulation. As opposed to stupid regulation. As opposed to more, yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, cost, of course, is one issue. The other issue is who sets the rules and what is the uniformity in those rules. So John referred to a, uh, and Aaron referred to a balkanization of regulation. That, that is a concern, and uh, John also referred to the fact that for 40 years the Bank of England's policy has been to try to get uh, international agreement, and the Bank, the Bank of England was one of the leaders in terms of the original Basel agreement, um, and I think that is the right thing to do. Globally, regulators themselves are constrained. I think when one is in the industry, you tend to see regulators as all-powerful and you have to jump when they say jump. But if you're a regulator, I'm interested in what Paul says, the regulators themselves feel constrained in what they can do. One of the constraints is what other regulators are doing. If you are very big and you have a very large market like the US, you can, to a reasonable degree, do your own thing. And Europe is increasingly trying to do that. And to the extent that Europe gets an act together and acts in a singular way, it is more able to do its own thing. But for many um, organizations, uh, regulatory organizations around the world, they are significantly constrained by what the, uh, what the international rules say. And overall, I think that's a good thing. Um, clearly, we want the international rules to be uh, sensible and well-balanced. But trying to get agreement at uh, international uh, level is an important thing to do and enables international organizations to exist. And I'm a great believer in, as an economist in the, uh, in the value of world trade and international organizations and facilitating that. And for that, you need international rules. But there are always many exceptions. And those of us who work in uh, cross-border organizations are always dealing with uh, with the noise that that creates and the differences in different jurisdictions. John Owen, as someone who runs a multinational organisation, do the uh, international regulators appear restrained to you? Well, John talked about the noise of, of, of the multiple uh, uh, regulators you face. But that noise is getting a lot louder. I think a number of regulators are waking up. I think they're looking at the 
very proactive uh, uh, stance taken by some of the UK regulators, the US regulators, thinking, feeling inadequate in their own countries about sort of level of protection they're affording their own economies. And that's causing banks a certain amount of consternation because what we're trying to do is provide, if you like, the, 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 the facilitation of world trade through whether it's trade finance, through its payments, foreign exchange and so forth. And you know, we sit on almost 40 countries and the difficulty we're facing is as those regulators tr start to flex their own muscles for perfectly good reasons in the context of their own uh, roles in their own countries. So we're having to actually build more and more cost into the system to answer to those uh, requirements uh, at the same time as trying to resolve irreconcilable demands placed on on us uh, in trying to sort of finance these these world and, and process these world trade flows so, so it's tougher and I, but I just think that is just the cost of doing business the consequence will be that I think a number of banks will find it increasingly difficult and uneconomic to support very large global networks. And that the danger is that it becomes almost a form of disguised protectionism and starts to sort of break, break down some of the support to world trade flows, which would clearly be a very bad thing. I mean, you know, RBS is incredibly focused on continuing to support its network. We have no intention of withdrawing from it, but we devote a huge amount of energy to each and every regulator around the world because that is your license to operate. And without it, you're not going to be there. But it is is not making the support we try to provide to global customers any easier. When, when you talk about local protectionism, uh, do you have in your mind the US rules on liquidity requirements for foreign subsidiaries, the, the anti-Deutsche Bank rule? I, 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 I have no particular country in mind. I mean, honestly, I can go to any one of the four, nearly 40 countries we're in and I can find you examples of things which would suggest there's something going on that helps very much the local economy and perhaps uh, some of the local players at the expense of the international. So it, there's nothing particular in any one country. Mm. But I'm struck by what you said. It is the cost of doing business. It's the cost of doing business. And, you know, it forces banks to get smarter. There's a lot of waste in the way that banks are organized technologically, organizationally. I think we need to, and, and, and this whole sort of response to the financial crisis, the regulatory response to it, the making the industry safer is causing banks on the two levels that were discussed by, by Paul, to, to have more costs to be borne by the banks, that's fine. The banks are going to be needed. World trade needs to be financed and needs to have its, its payment flows, if you like, uh, moved around the world. So, so banks, there is a need for them. They're going to have to get to a return on capital, which pays for the cost of capital. They've got to find a way to get there. And I think it's forcing a lot of soul searching within the organizations across the city and around the world to actually get to business models that provide industry what it's need and shareholders with a fair return. But they're not going to be 25, 35, whatever percent returns on equities they were before. Banks' stock is not going to trade at two, three times book value as it did in the past. But we do need to get to double digit type returns on equity to pay for the equity we deploy to get the prices back to a book value. That's the game. But there's a lot of work to be done to get there because the banks are just not efficient in the way they need to be. And John Trumbull, did you want to come back to that? You were uh, nodding at various points. No, well, I agree. I won't, uh, I won't repeat what John said. Right. Uh, Godfrey, how are these tensions between global transactions and local regulation to be resolved? Um, good question. Um, I think, uh, to, to, to your point, we see the same thing. Noise in terms of having to comply with all of them. And I think you're going to, as a global institution, and we're no different, you have to comply with everything uh, everywhere, which means to some extent you operate at a common denominator of all these regulations. That, that does create tensions between people who operate locally and who have less of that burden. And I think it means you need to be much more articulate about what businesses do you really compete in. Does this business warrant a global scale? If it warrants a global scale and gives you that advantage, then you should be in that business and that global approach should then give you an advantage against people who operate locally. If it's not a business that warrants a global presence, then probably it's better done by people who operate locally. So I think, and John made that same point earlier, I think you need to re-examine the businesses you're in, the models you operate under and, and clearly think where does you know, global give me an advantage and, uh, and, and then you stay in that business. And I don't think everything is bleak because at the same time we see business move becoming more global. There is a trend towards globalization and that means there is a business opportunity for people who operate but that comes with the burden of having to comply with regulations in all the countries that you operate in. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, that, yeah. so globalization with subsidiarity? To some extent. Absolutely. As a national regulator Paul, is your priority to implement the regulation you feel best appropriate for that territory or is it to look at what is done at a global level and see how you fit in with that? 
Yes, so <clears throat> I perform roles both at a, a, a UK, a European, and a global uh, uh, level. Um, it is in the long-term interest of the UK to get strong global standards that are then implemented in Europe. So John Greve mentioned this in, in, in his speech. So there's a, uh, there's, there's a consistency uh, of, uh, of aims at, uh, at all three levels. Uh, the problem arises where the regulations, either at the global or the European level, are, are, are not strong enough to deal with, uh, as I said before, the, uh, to internalise the, the, the cost, to, to, to uh, reduce the too big to fail uh, 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 problem. And it is the, um, the inadequate or incomplete internalisation of, of that st implicit state subsidy, the too big to, to fail problem, that is the driver, the key driver of balkanisation. Because after all, when those when too big to fail gets triggered, the cost is borne at the national level. It's not borne by uh, 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 the, gl the global community. Um, uh, 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 and uh, it's that that uh, the countries are seeking to protect. So that may change at a European level. Uh, so Europe, um, as always, with it, when everyone has these, these discussions, when they just sort of start and say, uh, 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 when we talk about a national uh, 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 level, we might be talking about Europe or we might be talking about the member state uh, 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 level because Europe is unique in the world in having a, a, a supranational, proper legal structure. Uh, I'm very keen to get your questions in if you uh, have them as well. If you've got them, uh, please put your hand up. We'll get a microphone to you as we did during the session with uh, Sir John Gieve. We've got uh, three or four more topic areas to uh, cover off here as well. So if you uh, have a question on the areas that we've discussed up to this point, if you put your hand up now, we'll get a microphone to you. I'm not seeing any. There's one here and I've been pointed to one at the back as well. So uh, whoever at the back has your hand up, if you keep your hand up until we get the microphone to you, then we'll take your question. Is it there yet? And then we'll take this uh, question at the front. Go ahead. Gentlemen, Bob Ford from Bob Ford Associates. Um, the British government has declared on a number of occasions that it wants to see more entrance into things like the payment infrastructures. But with the increasing regulation, is it not that that is causing the new entrants not to join, rather than the cost of actually joining? Thank you. Who wants to take that? Sounded like a regulatory question Indeed. to me. So um, you'll be aware, uh, so you, your question relating to new entrants um, into the banking and payment <coughs> systems. Um, You'll be aware that there has been a major initiative that has uh, published in recent weeks um, uh, on the prudential regulation of new entrant banks, indicating a, 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 a very substantial lowering of previous requirements uh, and then gradually stepping them up uh, only as and when new entrants uh, uh, um, uh, 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 grow in size. Also in that review, uh, a very significant improvement in, uh, in the PRA as compared to, uh, uh, to previous in terms of the ease of the regulator, uh, the authorization process. So I think those those two reforms, those two reforms, have substantially uh, addressed uh, um, the issue of regulation of new entrant banks compared to uh, uh, existing established banks. Having said that, um, uh, uh, all banks are subject to uh, a, a, a stronger set of regulations than they were, let us say, five, seven years ago, for which there is certainly no apology for me in, in respect of that. And new ancient banks are hugely uh, uh, valuable, or they are hugely helpful. Uh, 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 they are very much to be encouraged, but they need to be strong and stable. Uh, otherwise, none of the benefits that we uh, uh, wish to see from them uh, uh, will actually flow. 
Having said all of that, there are some more fundamental issues, I think, than regulation that drive competition, uh, or rather the, the, the incomplete, uh, uh, the, the absence of full competition uh, within the banking sector, particularly as between uh, 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 challenger banks and, uh, and large established banks. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question as well. I thought I saw a hand vaguely in this direction. If you keep your hand up, sir, until the microphone reaches you, and then when it does, if you can uh, tell us who you are and what organization you're from, and then uh, pose your question. <coughs> My name is Adnan Ghani. I work for John and Royal Bank of Scotland uh, on the trade side. Um, I also chair the Global Trade Industry Con Council, which Gottfried is aware of. Uh, I have actually a suggestion and would solicit some views from the panel members, especially Paul Sharma. Uh, one of the challenges, obviously, on the trade side that we debate, which is driving up the cost of doing trade globally, is the cost of compliance. And the challenge being that there's no central body anybody can go to for best practices because each one is determining what will be a best practice. So there's no checklist that you can tick off and say, look, I've done this, yes. and therefore can manage that situation. The suggestion actually, a solution potential is that there are multilaterals who deal with counterparties like banks in low-income environments. They could be SWIFT, they could be a counterparty, uh, counterparty that is credible, which can do a compliance check. And could that not become like a MOT test or a passport that the counterparty can then use for a certain period of time to say that they're compliant? Okay, so that you. avoids. Paul, thank the, you, Paul Sharma, yeah. MOTs. So I, 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 th I think if I understood correctly, your um, examples of, where, uh, of what you're talking about might be, let us say, in anti-money laundering, uh, 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 you know, where checks that you need to have on your customer, and that's very much links with what uh, uh, other panelists were saying about uh, 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 this being an area for cooperation uh, within the industry. I think you were taking it a stage further in the sense of... Um, to have a specific body. A specific body at a global level that might be able to do this. Um, I can certainly see the, the, the attractiveness of, uh, 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 of why you say that. O on the issues such as uh, uh, anti-money laundering, terrorist financing, uh, other types of know your counterparty type regulation, um, uh, 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 you know, they are matters that are within the UK institutional arrangements fall to the FCA rather than to the, uh, uh, to the PRA. So whilst I can see the attractiveness of what you're saying, I can't really comment in more detail than that. Right. Godfrey, a, a thought from you on this. It's interesting to make a link to the previous question because it, it is in this area where you see some of the new entrants being subject to these same regulations. I, two, two specific examples. One is uh, Chris Skinner's blog the other day was about him trying to effect a payment through the postal international payment system, which I guess is active in the UK, and finding that he got totally bogged down in KYC requirements, etc., and maybe the banks weren't so bad after all. Um, <laughs> the other one, also UK related, was that PayPal disconnected a UK coffee merchant for promoting Cuban coffee beans and PayPal being an American institution had to disconnect that UK merchants over the Cuban connection. So new entrants are, are pretty much subject to these same requirements um, and I think one angle to take what that cooperation in this area would also level the playing field uh, to, uh, to some extent uh, and, and make sure that everybody at least uh, that, that the burden of compliance doesn't become a barrier to, uh, to entry. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just nine minutes or so left on this so we'll press on with some of the other uh, topics that we wanted to cover. John, and if a strong regulation is the new, or, new norm, where is the room for differentiation uh, for you and your rival organizations? Well, there's a macro and a micro response, I think, to regulation. I think the macro response is to engage, is to try to ensure that the debate is, is reasonably uh, rational. And I think you know banks publicly obviously don't have a very loud voice and for very understandable reasons. But that's not to say that you can't engage, and we do actively engage with regulators around the world, just to think through some of the implications of, 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 of what they're proposing and to understand how you try and achieve the objectives that they're trying to set uh, uh, for their own countries and, and for the world generally. So I think there's a macro approach, which is very important. It then also goes to strategy. And I think that's where you start to see one of the dangers is that actually a number of banks who have have had in the past multi-regional or global type strategies may start to take the view that they just can't afford the license to operate costs of doing that. And so there is a danger. You get some concentration at the time you're trying to promote globalization 
to promote trade, to increase world growth, there is a danger that this, one of the mechanisms to support that, which is the banking system, starts to actually go a little bit the other way. And that, that is a risk. And I think that's worthy of a, a significant amount of debate at a macro level. At a micro level, there are a lot of responses banks can make. I mean, you know, if you think about SEPA, you know, and you think about the RBS is putting in place a thing called an accelerator, trying to help people get through what they need to do between now and February the 1st of next year. There are very specific responses you can make. The responses to the Dodd-Frank 1073 in, in the 103 payments, where you can actually provide the levels of data that are necessary, and you can have service providers like an RBS do that. So, so I think you can differentiate yourself by answering very specific micro needs that arise out of particular aspects of regulation. And I think there's a responsibility of the banking system to, act, to, to, to engage very actively with the macro level to ensure that what does emerge from this cloud of regulatory change is something that is actually going to enhance not just safety, but potential growth for, for, for world trade. So the idea that uh, all this regulation leads to a homogenized, pasteurized Backing, banking industry is just nonsense. It's a lovely idea. Uh, it's going to take <laughs> us a few weeks to get there. The U UHT of banking. John Tuttle, where does all this, the, the, the regulatory burden in the UK, the uh, concerns about the European uh, super regulator, regulator, where does this leave London as a global financial centre? Is it in peril? <laughs> I think, uh, again, London has uh, the great advantage of being very adaptable and uh, throughout most of my professional career of more than 30 years I've been going to conferences where London is terribly threatened by something that's going on in the, the political or regulatory or, or self-imposed space. Uh, and uh, it's always uh, survived and it's survived partly because we haven't tried to plan it uh, and it's been able to, uh, to adapt and has shown its uh, resilience. I think there is an issue vis-a-vis -vis Europe, and John uh, Gieve touched on that in his uh, speech uh, this morning. I think we will see a, more of a coming together in continental Europe in terms of the approach that it takes. I think if, if the result of that with a, a single regulator, the ECB is becoming very dominant in policy m making in Europe. I think if they make good choices, they will set the rules that will be highly relevant uh, for London. If they make bad choices, uh, they will push activity out of the euro area. In some cases, it may come to London. If we are caught by the wave of uh, any mistakes that they make, then when we too might be affected by that. But overall, I'm a glass half full person, particularly on this topic, and I think London, London is well placed uh, to adapt, uh, provided we don't do anything silly either ourselves in the industry or at the regulatory or political level but I think we have every chance of continuing to be successful. And so London is resilient? London is resilient in lots of different ways and it, uh, I was a bit concerned at the beginning of the conversation that we might have been giving the impression that we wanted uh, you know, very light regulation or something like that. London has a strong interest in effective regulation. It always has done uh, what I was trying to urge was a good debate about where the balance is. You can see the pendulum swinging at the moment. The, the issue is not letting it go too far, not trying to stop it. Uh, and I think we, we rely on the reputation of London as a good centre. Uh, customers want to go and do business in a place where they trust the counterparty. Uh, and Historically, London has been regarded as a place where you are safe doing business, uh, and that's what we want to preserve, and I'm, I'm sure Paul shares that aim. Do you? Certainly, I, 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 I believe that um, strong regulation, strong standards, strength of financial institutions is as much a, is a competitive advantage. Uh, uh, the, I think the... Um, uh, for now and hopefully for a long time, uh, uh, the era of competing on, uh, allegedly competing on cost, but really competing on how weak you are, you know, where the weaker gets the business, uh, uh, it, it, it is, is something that is not operative in, in the market because counterparties are sensitised now to the fact that banks fail. So the rules have changed. Uh, the, the rules of the game have changed and not just the regulatory rules. Right. Uh, we'll take one more if we've got it on the uh, floor. There's a hand uh, right here on the aisle about uh, a third of the way uh, down the room. If you keep your hand up, sir, it means that they can get the microphone uh, to you. Sorry for the uh, slight wait while it makes its way across. Uh, again, if you can tell us who you are and what organisation you are from. 
Don Harrington, Gartland and Molina Group. Uh, at the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned rank fencing. Who is being rent fenced from who? Is it the retail banks who had very lax lending practices or the investment banks who had lax trading practices? What should I have the question? Who is being ring fenced from whom? Who is ring fencing designed to protect? The argument in the public press is all about protecting the high street uh, branches, but the tenor of this question was it was those high street branches that caused much of the trouble to begin with. Mm-hmm. You and a couple of high street branches, John Owen? Why don't you take this one? <laughs> I'm kind of hoping there'd be a regulator's question to answer, actually. But um, <laughs> yes, RBS does have 2,000 branches, so they're about. Um, though, I you, think, though you didn't own HBOS. So I think we didn't own HBOS. Well, look, I mean, I, I, the, the, it's a very fair question because if you go back to who were two of the most conspicuous organisations which actually failed uh, it, during the crisis, one was a pure investment bank and one was a pure retail bank, right? So Northern Rock and Lehman Brothers were examples of each. So I don't think there is a necessary evil on one side or the other that is unique to one side or the other. Um, so the, the ring fencing, and I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Paul, but the, clearly the ring fencing is about removing the implied uh, 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 lender of last resort or the last sort of provider of capital being the taxpayer on behalf of activities which have nothing to do with the average taxpayer. And I think that is the key. Now, Paul, you probably should have a stronger answer than that. I mean, it's very much along the, 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 the same line. So, rig fencing is designed to help in two respects. Firstly, to help prevent, reduce the probability of a bank failing. Uh, and secondly, when it fails, to give more options to the authorities. When you have a single bank that does both retail and wholesale and they're so intertwined one, to the, one within the other, you, one can face the situation that one either saves everything or saves nothing. When one has ring-fenced institutions, uh, one has greater degrees of optionality for the government in the use of public funds uh, 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 to save only part and let part go. Yes, I think the broader point was that investment banking got the bad rap here. Indeed, indeed. Um, and a, uh, uh, the, the questioner's point where, uh, that um, uh, uh, the business that will be located within the ring fence can itself be very risky is correct. Is one reason why Sir John Vickers in his report not merely recommended ring fencing but also recommended higher capital requirements, an extra 3% of capital for the business within the ring fence in order to uh, recognise precisely that point. Okay. Uh, We're standing between these people and their coffee break, so I'm just going to have one final uh, thought. Uh, I know there are a lot of banking students and banking graduates in the room today, and they're very welcome uh, at this early stage of their career. John Trudnell, in their working lives, do you think they'll reach the point where they'll be able to say, yes, we are city bankers, and not feel a sense of residual shame? (laughs) It's very interesting, isn't it? Yes, I used to describe myself as a banker. I just I describe myself as a as a utility provider these days. But <laughs> but yes, the, uh, I began by talking about the cycle. These things do have a natural cycle, and uh, we will see growth and banks. Uh, we have seen the. The problems countries have when they don't have banks and uh, when, when the banks have failed. Uh, it is such a, uh, an essential part of an effective economy. We will get back to normality uh, in the youngsters' lifetime, I'm sure. Uh, whether, it, whether in my working lifetime is, is a different question. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can you thank, please, John Trundle, Paul Sharma, John Owens, and Gottfried Liebrand. Uh, and thank you for your input as well. We're going into the coffee break now. Uh, remember that uh, at 11.30, the dedicated business streams start in various points around the building. Also, the special interest sessions. Do check your programme to find out where you're meant to be for a prompt start at 11.30. Thank you very much.